typical computer problems with you know, finding a laptop that they work. Okay, so very briefly, I'm just going to walk through some of the regional data that we've assembled and a few of the very preliminary things that we've done with it. Again, as Jack just mentioned, it's going to be within a subset of the overall sustained southern Maine region. And that's, I think as Jeff also mentioned, really a function of where these various disparate data sets narrow down and overlap enough that you can do some kind of meaningful analysis over a single area. So let's see what comes up next here. A little faded, but the starting point and again, the place from which the nine sustained southern Maine pilot communities were selected is this collection of 160 market centers that were identified by Ben and Richard and I guess another, a bit of an entourage of experts um, who traveled around the region and sort of using these six basic classifications identified um, centers of commercial and employment activity little stars represent those. Um, we'll see them again in various future slides. We chose for our initial modeling transportation analysis zones, uh, which are used in transportation planning to kind of equalize um, origin and destination groups and Although you'll see, we'll get down to some parcel data. We thought it might overwhelm the modest computing power we had if we started to do models that use the parcel data. At some point, we'll probably do that. But to begin with, we had, again, certain types of census data and, and others that could be aggregated into these transportation analysis zones. And so that became, again, the unit of analysis that we were going to use for the, the models that we ran and the basic analysis of the data. Another little washed out map here. So taking the parcel data, um, and for any of this data, I have to say these, again, come from different sources. A lot of people before me, some of them in this room, spent a lot of time collecting, refining, editing this data. I got it in stages of near completion, tried to make my own corrections and aggregations in the process, I'm sure I corrupted some of the good work that was done before me, so if you see mistakes that are glare at you, it's probably my fault. Um, the parcel data, one of the key aspects of the parcel data that we took was uh, coding um, to determine which parcels were, we could define as vacant. Um, and we used a definition that was developed by Judy Colby George and some of the build out analyses she does, where we just looked. Uh, at assessed value of improvements on a parcel, and if it was less than $5,000, we defined it as vacant. So there may be parcels here, and this, this, the, the gold or yellow spread there shows there's, there's quite a lot of undeveloped parcel land in the region. Now, as we get to some of the future maps, you'll see that this parcel data is a larger data set than some of the TAZ and, and zoning data. So when we get to future analyses, the map is going to shrink down a little bit because we don't have all the layers we wanted to do some of the analyses. And I think this, uh, in theory anyway, the, the vacant parcels also excludes conservation land. So if there's a park or a dedicated conservation land. Do we have all the conservation land taken out? Probably not. Or if there's a very large parcel hundreds of acres that has one building on it, that would exclude as well? It would if that building's worth more than $5,000. So, exactly. Let me just mention a, uh, just as a brief interjection that Liz, through SPO, uh, or whatever it was called, uh, yeah. uh, years ago funded Jim Thomas, currently is the assessor of SACO, I believe, and quite a good computer programmer, and myself to do a build-out calculator on ArcView, which no longer exists, 
in a language that no longer exists. And and we, we did, you know, we programmed a, a way to approach dealing with the 100 acres that has one house on it, or 10 acres that has one house on it. It was very complicated and, uh, you know, we, we don't, we haven't done anything like that with this yet, although it, it is possible, where we would take into account the redevelopment potential of extensive underdeveloped parcels throughout, you know, a residential, suburban, exurban landscape. I just wanted to acknowledge Liz's foresight in trying to get people thinking about that stuff way back. Thank you. Eric. Yeah, and of course, all that can be very situational. If you have a hundred acre parcel that belongs to a family that's got a, you know, a heritage, yeah. historic home on it, less likely to be subdivided perhaps than something that's got, you know, a double wide manufactured home and really it's, you know, it's made for future development. So, um, so here we are with the, again, the generalized regional zoning map. Um, what you've got in front of you. This is the one that people might find the most reasons to argue that, that people's dissatisfaction is with it is going to come because if they're familiar with a particular town, they're going to say, well, you've coded this particular district commercial when it's not, it's mixed use, and it comes down to how best to make these districts comparable over the entire region. So it's really trying to reduce each zoning district to its, I guess, least common denominator, the, the sort of primary use envisioned by that particular district as it falls within the basic categories. And I guess maybe you can read them on the map. Unfortunately, the, the legend here comes from a different map that was inserted in. I should have probably put that legend um, body of the slide there. Um, but there are four categories of residential based on the density permitted. There's a commercial, which is red. So those are yellow. The red represents a commercial, the purple industrial. The two shades of green are different types of resource protection. The blue is mixed use. And then there's a, an other category to capture things that don't quite fit into any of those categories. A number of them are contract zones, and then also up there in Brunswick, which is kind of a late addition. There's the Brunswick Naval Air Station, which is a little bit in transition. That's actually since been broken down into sub-zoning districts, but we haven't been able to classify them yet. This is kind of looking at the vacant parcels and the zoning data together over the region. So what we've got here is the red shaded areas. And again, you can see that there's a line there just because of where data didn't overlap. Uh, the red shaded areas are your vacant land that is zoned for residential densities of at least one dwelling unit per acre for mixed use. So it excludes commercial. Uh, that is also vacant. So it's those characteristics. High density, if you define high as one dwelling unit per acre or, or more, um, that's also vacant land. And then the thing that's a little difficult to see here, um, you pick up the yellow dots there a little bit better. Those are the market centers. The yellow circles are a quarter mile radius from a market center. And then there's actually a blue circle that's a one mile radius. You can kind of see that one there. Um, I wish this looked a little bit better. It looked good on the computer screen. It's one of those things that doesn't project as well. Um, so in a sense, it's a, a bit of a roadmap for possible future development. It might also highlight some lost opportunities where there's a market center with no land that's appropriately zoned that's vacant to do any kind of future development. So it might be a chance to rethink that. OK. I think we're on sort of the next group of slides here. Now we're kind of looking at. population data. 
um, both current in the sense that it derives from 2010 census data, and this is where this is data that was developed primarily by Charlie, so if I'm saying something incorrect about how it was compiled or, or used, uh, correct me immediately. Um, but this is residential density based on, the, I believe, the 2010 census data as of 2009, um, broken down by TAZ. And I guess really the important thing to sort of point out is that this lightest color, which is the least dense here, is uh, a TAZ that has, on average, less than a half a dwelling unit per acre, or sort of two lot, two acre zoning would translate to density. Um, that's most of the region. You know, anything denser really is focused right around the Portland area, with very few exceptions. Um, this map is showing um, raw density, which is showing the number of dwelling units per total acre in a TAZ. Um, net density we would define as, as the number of dwelling units over any acreage that's developed. But we don't distinguish developed versus undeveloped um, between commercial and residential. So it's a little bit, a little bit awkward, I think, in that sense. And this is just sort of a baseline. This is the starting point for what the region looks like currently, although it probably doesn't quite look like this currently because of the, the recession. It's a little hard to tell what it looks like. So this data came with a forecast that Charlie put together. Um, I guess four packs, is that? It's, it's a forecast that's been used in a variety of projects, such as the Gorham East-West Corridor, and it also is a subset of a statewide econometric forecast that then drives population forecasts for sub-areas of the state. And uh, if that's insufficient, Charlie will add any other comments about it as we go along. Um, so the forecast uses this uh, econometric um, method to predict a or forecast uh, populations in each of the TAZs in 2035. Um, and again, this is showing it in terms of residential density. Uh, and it doesn't look all that different, really, in terms of density than the baseline 2009. So this is what that previous map would look like in 2035. But we have different ways of displaying this. So the, the forecast said there would be 39,000 or approximately 39,600 new dwelling units over this area, the colored area, by 2035, so between 2009 and 2035. This is a map of the number of new dwelling units in each of those TAZs that's predicted under this, this forecast. I'm trying to think if I can read this now. Um, well, I won't get into specific numbers, but you can see that this is a, a fairly sprawly looking forecast. It's, uh, you know, it's pushing the darker red, which are the higher absolute numbers of new units into sort of New Gloucester Gray and the Lakes region, Standish, um, although also down here in Scarborough. Um, again, absolute numbers. This is showing percent change, so it's uh, showing the, the change rather than absolute numbers. Um, and again, a little bit similar. So again, going up that sort of corridor gray, New Gloucester, um, there's a fair amount of change going on there um, in Scarborough here, and then that's Arundel, right? Charlie tells us that Arundel sticking out there is partly a forecasting artifact, if that's right. That Arundel is not the new Scarborough. That's <laughs> <laughs> not a way to tell. <laughs> um, but, but just so I can add a comment, Eric, you know, there's other evidence that. Uh, 
we've been seeing that the Gray New Gloucester panel, uh, North Yarmouth area, this is pre-recession for economic forecasting to drive this population and housing, um, you know, projection. But um, if if some of that is still true, you know, that area is poised for a lot of change with the rate of change perhaps slowing on you know, Gorham, Standish, Freeport, and so on. That's part of the implication of this forecast for what it's worth. And and the Scarborough area, you know, the south side of the urban core of the region continuing to still grow a lot under this forecast. But then again, this is a pre-recession economic employment activity forecast. Uh, and the only other caveat, again, with this forecast is it has, it takes into account nothing to do with any constraints. There are no constraints, physical constraints on where growth will go. So there's, it doesn't take into account zoning restrictions or the supply of vacant land or the ease of subdivision. It just says, you know, based on basically past performance and where jobs are going to be, this is where new growth is likely to occur. Okay. So finally, we get to the community biz. Um, we ran, again, to begin with, very simple allocation models, which took this same number of forecast growth and tried to allocate it with a little bit more recognition of some of the constraints that might actually apply to growth. Um, and also, factors that might drive growth in particular directions. So the two things that this model really takes into account are, one, the attractiveness of the market centers as potentially pulling growth towards them, and the supply of vacant land as constraining the growth. This one kind of takes the, so this assumes essentially that New development is going to be attracted towards the market centers, but it is only going to take place on land that we had previously defined as vacant. Um, so it's taking those same 39,600 units and allocating them using a model that, takes, that uses those two assumptions. Now it also is going to assume we have to make sort of a baseline assumption about the supply of acreage and this is saying, well, we looked at what the typical sort of density of new development, approximately one dwelling unit per acre, so we're going to allocate it along those lines. And that's a maximum density, in right. other words. So it could be less dense, but it's not going to be any more dense than new development. And that also, you can see, looks, despite the attractiveness of the market centers, it still ends up looking pretty dispersed. And again, these are absolute numbers of new new developments using that. Um, this is just showing the density as opposed to the absolute numbers. So there's the absolute numbers. Here's density. Again, the density in any of these doesn't change all that much because we're really not talking about that many more units. It's not going to change things dramatically in terms of, of overall density. Um, and you can sort of see that. Um, although the allocation model, I guess, looks a little bit more compact. So on the left, you might argue it looks a little bit more a little bit more spread out, or at least there are some more concentrations going out the corridors towards. So on the left is the, the econometric model, and on the right is the community biz model. And you can see going up here, North Windham, there's a little bit more a little bit more density taking place up there as opposed to the, the model that we developed the community is. But keep in mind that the, the forecast allocation on the right is not allowing any new housing location denser than one acre minimum lot size or one right. dwelling unit per acre, which is very reflective of the regional average uh, and of issues like the one we started out with with people in Cumberland saying, well, you know, changing minimum lot sizes from four acres to two acres is like destroying our community landscape. So it's an issue. And also the one on the left, the, the econometric forecast, 
again, it's it's unconstrained at all by supply of land or regulatory environment. It's simply putting the units where you think they're going to go. Um, and here again, here's absolute numbers, and I apologize, these are now different color scale. To this. Well, the interesting thing is the scales are, are quite different. <laughs> um, so on the right, which is the, the model, um, the new dwelling units, I think the, the densest TAZ, or the TAZs with the greatest change over here end up with it between 100 and 200 new units. And over here, it's, uh, it goes up over 500 new units. So that it was hard to scale these. We did this kind of on the fly so that they would be comparable. And to be honest, I'm not. In a sense, again, if you go back to the previous slides, there's not a huge difference in the way these two come out. Um, because I think, again, of the, uh, the one acre um, lot size, the one, one unit per acre uh, density the model used kind of reflects the, the density that would take place, has taken place anyway. In other words, it's kind of a business as usual model of the future, much like the econometric forecast, which doesn't even take into account vacant land or any density policy. Those you can consider business as usual looks.